Okay guys, this is Mr. Champlin. Today we're going to be talking about friction. Uh, make sure once you're done with this that you answer the friction constant questions. Uh, then tomorrow I'll have some friction problems for you. All right, so friction, what is it? Well, friction is the force that occurs when we have uh, bodies or objects that are in contact. So in other words, things have to be touching in order for there to be friction. So let's take, uh, for example, a box of rocks that's sitting on a table. Um, you could have a force pushing the box of rocks this way, but remember, you're going to have uh, friction uh, going in this direction and also friction going in this direction. So, for example, if you put a box of rocks on a table and you don't touch it, that box of rocks is not going to go anywhere, right? And that's because there are fric there's frictional forces uh, acting on it in all of the directions, and of course, they cancel out. So one thing that we want to think about is what actually causes friction. So we're all aware of friction. We've all experienced it through our lives. Friction is the reason why we can you know, stand up. It's the reason why a car can break, all of these things. So, But what actually causes friction? Well, if we look at the surfaces on a microscopic le uh, level, we're going to see that there's ridges and bumps on that surface. Now, this might be something like the top of the table. This surface here might be something like glass. So glass is very smooth and it doesn't have a lot of friction. However, it has some friction, right? So no matter what it is, it's going to have at least some friction. Even the slipperiest, frictionless thing you can possibly think of is going to have some friction. So that is probably because it's not perfectly smooth, right? Nothing on the microscopic level is going to be perfectly smooth. So what happens when these surfaces, when they um, touch each other, right? When they're moving past. So let's say this surface is moving this way and this surface is moving this way. You're, the All these bumps and ridges and grooves are going to hit each other and it's going to slow things down. Another way of thinking about it is if you take your hands and you rub your hands together really rapidly, your hands get warmer, right? And that is because of friction. So, of course, if you look at your hands very closely, your hands, your skin is not perfectly smooth. It's covered in all these ridges that make up your fingerprints. All right, so a few more things we need to talk about as far as friction goes. So friction is due to the electrostatic attraction between the atoms of the objects. All right, so again, um, they are sort of attracted to one another. Now friction, uh, as we mentioned, is important and it's good because it makes it so we can slow down. It makes it so we can turn. If we live in a world with no friction, we could never slow down and we could never turn. In fact, we could probably never speed up either. Uh, when you think about it, if you're standing and you want to move forward, you have to you know, have some friction to, uh, to be able to push off the floor in order to move. So really, friction is important. It helps us to uh, move in the environment that we live in. Now, whenever you have friction, you're going to have waste heat that's produced, right? So we just mentioned uh, if you were to rub your hands together, uh, we know there's friction there, and of course, it generates some heat. Um, because of friction, uh, of course, there are good things about friction, but there's also bad things. The bad thing about friction is you got to push harder or longer to accelerate an object, but that's just the price we pay. So like any force, uh, friction has an action reaction um, you know pairing to it now some things that uh, you think you might know about friction but actually is not true so many people think that the surface area matters that in other words the more surface area you area you have the more friction you're gonna have right well it turns out that's actually not true the surface area does not matter uh, the type of surface does matter, and certainly the weight of the object you are trying to move also does matter. But it turns out the surface area does not matter. So if we if we are trying to move two sort of piles of you know bricks here, um, this pile of bricks is obviously has four times more mass, even though it's pounds. It's got four times as much mass. It's going to be much harder to move these bricks than these bricks, even though the surface area of the bricks that are touching the ground would be the same. Now we can take all friction, we can divide it into two main groups. We have what's called static friction and we have what's called um, kinetic or sliding friction. Now static friction is the friction that 
the force you must overcome in order to budge or to start an object moving. So think about something that's been sitting there for a long time. Uh, think about uh, something like a refrigerator or a stove. Maybe you're moving out of your house and you're trying to move the sofa or the stove or the, or the refrigerator. It's been, it's been there for a long time. It gets kind of stuck to whatever surface that it's on and it takes a lot of force to kind of move it. But once you move it, it's generally easier to keep it moving. And that force, that friction that you have to overcome to keep something moving is called the kinetic friction. So also think about a car. Maybe your car breaks down um, and you can sort of push that car. It's really hard to get it going. But once you start that car rolling, it's usually not that bad uh, to sort of you know keep it rolling. So again, friction. What makes some friction stronger than others? Well, uh, it has to do with how hard the two objects are pressed together by the normal force. Now let me remind you what is the normal force. The normal force is the force that acts in opposition to gravity. So gravity is pulling the object down, the normal force is going to be pushing it up. So the greater the weight of the object, the greater the normal force will be and therefore the greater the friction will be. Other things that affect the amount of friction or the strength of the force of friction would be what the material is made of. So whether that material is glass or concrete or steel or plastic, that's going to make a difference with how much friction there is. So we often measure the amount of friction that is related to a particular material using this thing called the coefficient of friction. And it, it has this strange symbol called mu. And this is a number, usually a decimal, usually a number less than one. That kind of gives us an idea of, um, of how you know, rough it is or smooth it is and therefore how much friction will be produced. So this becomes important later when we have to solve problems involving um, you know, friction. So again, attributes or things that have no effect on friction would be the contact area. So the amount of area that the surface area the objects have, that doesn't matter. And also the speed. Um, if you slide it fast or slow, shouldn't matter. That, that, uh, it should be the same amount of friction. All right, so again, the coefficient of friction is this sort of number, and it depends on what the material is made of. Uh, because we have two types of friction, we can have two different coefficients of friction, one for static friction and one for um, kinetic or sliding friction. Now, the static friction coefficient of friction is always going to be greater than the coefficient of friction um, for sliding friction. The bigger the coefficient of friction, the greater the frictional force that's required to overcome it and to move the object. Um, so example... Um, if you um, had some steel and you said, what is the coefficient of friction for steel and ice? That'd probably be pretty low, right? So think of like ice skates. Um, if you have, if you want to know the coefficient of friction of scrambled eggs on a Teflon frying pan, probably would be pretty low. Whereas if you uh, thought about, you know, rubber on, you know, concrete, that would probably be a much, much higher co uh, coefficient of friction or a cardboard box on, um, you know, carpeting. That would probably be a fairly high coefficient of friction. So here's our formula for determining static friction. So um, the static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times n or the normal force. Uh, so pretty easy formula. Uh, and the next formula, the kinetic friction is really the same thing. It's just the force of the kinetic friction is equal to the coefficient of the kinetic friction times the normal force. So the only difference is between these two things is you have to use the right coefficient of friction. If you're using, if you're moving an object for the first time, you need to use the the coefficient of static friction. If you're just trying to keep an object moving, you've got to use the coefficient of the kinetic friction. So here's just a few numbers just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. If you're talking about steel on steel, the, the, the uh, coefficient of static friction is 0.74. The coefficient of the kinetic friction is 0.57. So again, you would always 
expect the coefficient of the kinetic friction to be less than the coefficient of the static friction simply because it takes more force to get something moving. Um, here we have glass on glass. Ooh. So you think of glass as being smooth? The coefficient of friction is actually quite high, 0.94 to uh, get it going. Uh, here's an interesting one, the synovial joints in humans. So for example, your shoulder joints and your and your hip joints, the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.01 and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.003. So very low, right, which, which kind of makes sense. Um, you know, you want to keep you the the uh, friction in your joints quite low. So in that formula that we just discussed, the, uh, we have N or the normal force. So remember that the normal force is equal to the force of gravity. So if gravity is pulling down on an object with a force of 20 newtons, the normal force is also 20 newtons. It's just 20 newtons going up. Okay, we do need to talk about a sort of a specific uh, type of friction, and that is air resistance. Now, often in this class, we say, hey, don't worry about air resistance, just ignore it. But air resistance is actually, in real life, is a pretty big thing, right? If you're flying an airplane or driving a car or doing anything where you're moving, um, air resistance plays a big role in this. So... What is air resistance? Well, air resistance is essentially friction with air, right? So we don't think of the air. We move through the air all the time. We don't give it a second thought. But as you're moving through the air, you are actually, it does take energy to move through the air. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but if you think of yourself as like running on the beach uh, and, and you're running through the ocean, you know, let's say the water's up to your waist, it's really hard to run through the water. But when you get out of the water and you're running through the air, you're like, oh, this is easy. All right. Yes, there is less uh, friction with the air than with water, right? But uh, there's still friction. It's still a thing. So what, what sort of has an effect on the amount of friction with the air or air resistance? Well, it's going to be the speed. Okay. It depends how fast the object is going. It's It depends on the cross-sectional area. So in other words... Uh, sort of the the part that's hitting the air how you know how big is that the air density makes a difference right so if you're at sea level the air is gonna be denser than if you're in you know Colorado because Colorado is a mile high um, and the air is therefore less dense so if you were to throw a football on the beach it's gonna be harder to do that you're not gonna throw it as far as you as if you threw a football in you know Colorado because the air is more dense and other things like uh, shape are going to also uh, make a difference. So if you think about an object that's falling through the air, so here we have two objects. We have this box here, and then we have a bigger box that has four times the area. Okay. Uh, as the object gets bigger, the volume is going to increase faster than the surface area. Uh, so bigger objects tend to fall faster even though they have less surface area because they have essentially more mass or more weight. Okay. So, um, so things that are uh, smaller or uh, they tend to fall more slowly simply because there's a more surface area to volume or more surface area compared to their actual weight. So terminal velocity is this uh, concept. If when an object is falling, it's not going to accelerate forever. It's going to go faster and faster and faster, and then eventually it's going to reach a point where it's not going to go any faster. So this is the point that we call the terminal velocity. And the terminal velocity is when the acceleration is equal to zero. Now, just because the acceleration is zero doesn't mean you're not moving. You can be actually be moving quite fast. You could be going, for example, if a person jumps out of a plane, right, they will accelerate and speed up and speed up until they reach a certain point, probably around 150 to 200 miles per hour, and then they're going to stop. You know, They're not going to speed up anymore. They're still going to be moving at this very high speed, but they're not going to be um, accelerating. And of course, you know from you know seeing things in the movies and such, if you spread your legs and your arms like these guys are here, they're going to be creating more surface area. They therefore are going to be um, 
have a lower terminal velocity versus somebody like this guy that puts their arms and legs together, less surface area, and just falls towards the Earth. Okay, let's take a quick, a quick look at a sample uh, friction problem. And then again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow you will have a few that you'll have to do. So this problem says, a 24 kilogram uh, uh, crate is at rest on a horizontal uh, floor. It requires 150 newtons of force to set it in motion. Find the coefficient of static friction between the crate and the floor. Now, I forgot to put in the fact this was static friction, but um, you are starting to move the object, so therefore uh, the mu here is actually should be mu s, or the coefficient of, of static friction. So you're trying to find mu, or the coefficient of static friction. You know the force of friction. They give it to you. It's 150 newtons. And you also know the normal force. Now, they don't say this is the normal force, but they do give you the mass. So remember uh, that the normal force is this is equal to, but going opposite to the force of gravity or the weight of the object. We know that weight is mass times g or mass times acceleration. So we can figure out the normal force by simply taking the mass of the object, which in this case is 24, and multiplying times 9.81 or the acceleration of gravity. So when we solve this, we get a coefficient of static friction of equal to 0.6. And this makes total sense because not always, but typically the coefficient of friction is going to be a decimal or less than one. All right, I hope this was helpful. Make sure you answer the concept questions uh, for today, and tomorrow you will be doing some, uh, some, some friction problems.